So good to be here, and I just want to say again, happy Mother's Day to all the moms in the room, and including spiritual moms. In my book, if you have the heart of a mom, you are a mom. So happy Mother's Day. You are seen and you are loved so much. Uh, For those of you that do not know me, again, my name is Polly Sanders, and I am married to Skip Sanders. We have two daughters, Haven, who is three, and Anna, who is one. little family picture there for you. Um, Skip and I have attended Hickory Ridge uh, since we were married in 2017, and I actually have attended here for most of my life. My dad previously pastored here before Pastor Justin, so I grew up here. This is where I was baptized and mentored and attended youth group and all the things, and I've come and gone for different reasons, but this has always been home, and this body um, of believers is just so precious to me and my family. And I am just truly honored to be able to stand up here today and to share with you what God has put in my heart, not just for Hickory Ridge, but the church as a whole. Um, So I just want to thank Pastor Justin for asking uh, me to do this. This is just really an honor and a privilege. So I'm excited to get into this. Um, So we're concluding this series today called Trending. And we've been talking about, we've been diving into what's trending in our culture, things we might see on social media, um, you know, bumper stickers, t-shirts, what have you. And um, just really things that a lot of people are saying, and we're taking that and we're comparing it to the Word of God and what His Word says about it. And um, as we're celebrating moms today, I just I find it so fitting to talk about this next trend that's really impacted our perception of women's roles and how we interact with men. And that trend is this: I'm a girl, or I'm a I'm a woman. What's your superpower? And some of you are like, all right, let's go. And some of you are like, yeah, no, let's go. We're out. And I get it. Just hold tight with me. We're, we're going to go into God's word and what it says. Or maybe you've seen this saying, girls rule and boys drool. I don't know if you can read that. Very mature, yeah. Um, or maybe you've seen this, the future is female. Okay, all right. So before we go into our main text in scripture, we need to ask a question. And this question is, why do women think they need to have a superpower or take ownership of the future? Why do we think we need that? Why do we think we need to make sure everyone knows that being a woman is a superpower? (laughs) I mean, you know. Like, why do we think we need to do that? And there's a lot of reasons, but I think one of them is, one main one is probably the history in our country. Uh, From women not being able to vote until 1920, uh, to how women were looked at as a whole, and just the expectations that there have been on women. I think that, you know, our our country was founded on biblical values, but scripture was taken out of context, and some things were taught and looked at incorrectly over the years. So to give us a better picture of kind of what ladies are coming out of that make them feel like they need to have this validation, I want to read to you an extract from 1950 from a, a high school economics textbook, and it's called Tips to Look After Your Husband. They had to train them, you know. So I'm going to read just a few things from this. Uh, Prepare yourself. Take 15 minutes to rest so you will be refreshed when he arrives. Touch up your makeup, put a ribbon in your hair, and be fresh looking. He has just been with a lot of work-weary people, but be happy and a little more interesting. His boring day may need a lift. Okay. Uh, Clear away the clutter. Make one last trip through the main part of the house just before your husband arrives, gathering up school books, toys, paper, etc. Then run a dust cloth over the tables. Your husband will feel he has reached a haven of rest and order, and it will give you a lift too. It sure would. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right then. Prepare the children. Take a few minutes to wash the children's hands and faces if they are small. Comb their hair, and if necessary, change their clothes. They are little treasures, and he would like to see them playing the part. <laughs> Me too. Okay. This next one's my favorite. Minimize all noise. At the time of his arrival, eliminate all noise of washer, dryer, dishwasher, or vacuum. Okay. Try to encourage the children to be quiet. (laughs) I love it. Be happy to see him, greet him with a warm smile, and be glad to see him. A little repetitive. Okay. Some don'ts. Don't greet him with problems or complaints. Do not complain if he's late for dinner. Count this as minor compared with what he might have gone through that day. Mm. Make him comfortable. Have him lean back in a comfortable chair or suggest he lie down in the bedroom. Have a cool or warm drink ready for him. Arrange his pillow and offer to take off his shoes. (laughs) 
speak in a low, soft, soothing, and pleasant voice, <laughs> ladies, allow him to relax and unwind. Listen to him. You might have a lot of things to tell him at the moment of his arrival, but that is not the time. Let him speak first. <laughs> the goal of this is to try to make your home a place of peace and order where your husband can renew himself in body and spirit. So that's what our young girls were reading in high school to get them ready for marriage. Um, you know, and look, I, I want my husband to feel these things when he comes home. I want Skip to feel like he's coming home to a comfortable place where he can rest and refresh. Absolutely. But I think we can all agree it's a little one-sided. I don't see a side that says take care of the wife anywhere, you know. So it was. It was a little one-sided, a little unbalanced, a little unhealthy uh, back in our, our history. So that's what we're coming out of. And it's created quite a bit of bitterness, I think, some resentment in our culture. So now our culture is overcompensating and encouraging women to not just be equal to, but to overpower men and to make them look less than. And I want to dive into God's word today about men and women and look at what the truth actually is, because God has things to say about this. So uh, we're going to be looking at two main texts today. Um, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Genesis 2, 18 to 24. And what I want to do is I want to first look at God's original design. So I'm going to go back to the garden and look at how God set things up. And then I want to look at what happened to this design because clearly something happened. It doesn't look the same as it did then. And then I want to look at the consequences of what happened and finally what now? What do we do now? So let's go to Genesis 2, 18 to 24. God just got done making the world. No big deal. Made Adam, put him in the garden, gave him responsibility to name animals. And then God says this, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed it up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And that last verse is, is very uh, key. Um, I know it looks like it's randomly put in there, but we do need to know that for the future and what we're going to go through later. So this, this is God's original design, and I want to break this down just a little bit. The first thing I want to look at is the very beginning of verse 18, because up until this point, God creating everything, he had been saying, it is good, it is good, it is good. Everything he made, it was good. But this is the first time we see God say, it is not good for man to be alone. He wasn't saying anything he had created wasn't good. He was saying the absence of something I haven't created yet is not good. So I will make him a helper fit for him. And I want to look at that particular phrase because I think the word helper is one of those trigger words that gets ladies a little upset. It's also a word that has been abused and not um, spoken out correctly. So we want to look at that. What does that phrase actually mean? Because that really matters. So let's go to the original, the original language, the original Hebrew, the word that describes that phrase, helper fit for him, is konegdo. And it means this, a help corresponding to him or equal and adequate to himself. If you think about it, really it's a team. It's a team. If you look at a team in any organized sport and you have a lot of different positions on the team, but none of them hold less value. You need every single position in order to complete the task you're trying to complete as a team. And that was what this was supposed to be. So we see God do this incredible thing. And he, he performs this incredible surgery and creates woman. So this is the next thing I want to look at. Up until this point, God had made everything living out of dust. So why did God decide to make Eve out of Adam's rib? Why that difference? That matters. And this is, what it, this is why. 
God used existing tissue to create Eve to show that they were made of the same substance and both image bearers of God. That was their value, the same value. They both had that value. What we need to do is we need to change this mindset that if whoever's in charge is better and whoever's the helper is less than, that is not correct. The positions do not define our value. What we do does not define who we are. Who we are should define what we do. In other words, I'm not going to do, a, I don't do a bunch of stuff to become a child of God. I am a child of God, therefore I do a bunch of stuff. It should flow out of that. And Eve's value, her position, is an image bearer of God. And because she is, she can help Adam. It does not change her value. It's just a different position. And Adam, we can see, is already put in a leadership position. He was given a command to name the animals to tend to the garden. He was given responsibility as a leader would. But God sees this responsibility is too big for him to do alone. He needed a helper fit for him. So he's bringing in all these animals, but they're not fit. They're not good enough. They're not adequate to himself. So God creates Eve and brings him a helper fit for him, made of the same substance to be a image bearer with him of God. It's a beautiful design that God has set up here. So they're in the garden and they're doing their tasks, right? They're, they're walking out what God has set up and it's beautiful. They're in paradise. So what happened to God's design? What happened to it? Because something happened. So before we go into our next uh, scripture here, what we need to understand is they're, they're doing their thing, what God has told them to do, and all of a sudden, the serpent who we know is the devil approaches Eve and has this dialogue with her and basically starts to convince her to doubt who God is and his goodness. God had given them one commandment. Do not, you can eat of any tree, but do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the serpent says to Eve, God told you you're going to die. If you eat from that, you're not really going to die. You're just going to know stuff that God knows, and he just doesn't want you to. And Eve believes him. She believes and starts to doubt the goodness of God and his word. So then go with me now to Genesis 3, 16 to 19. I'm sorry, Genesis 3, 6 through 7. And let's see what happened to God's design. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and then it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So again, I told you earlier, them not being ashamed that they're naked is a big deal. Now they are ashamed, and they're sewing fig leaves together to cover themselves because they're ashamed of their sin for the very first time. So what happened here? How does this have anything to do with the roles that they've been given? And this is what it is. Eve leads... Adam follows, they show the first incident of reversing roles for the first time, and it is disastrous. It is disastrous. So what's happening is we know that Adam is standing here with her. It says her husband was with her, and as far as we know, he's being silent. He's not talking. All the conversating is happening, happening between Eve and the serpent. This is what should have happened in that moment if they were walking in their roles correctly. Eve should have been communicating with Adam. They should have been a team in that moment. And as she is doubting God's goodness and his word, Adam should have been stepping in as her leader and defending who God is to her, pointing her back to the truth of who God is and saying, no, God is good. He would not, he would not lie to us. But he remains silent as far as we know. So Eve is leading and Adam is following, and it's disastrous. It leads to shame and it leads to brokenness. So, what are the consequences of what happened? After they put on their fig leaves and they're hiding, I love this moment in Scripture that is described for us. It's just beautiful what happens here. It says that they hear God walking in the garden because that was their life. They were walking literally with God in the garden. It's incredible. But they hear him walking in the garden while they're hiding and they're afraid. They don't want him to find them, which is just funny now because we know God sees us. He knows where we are always. But the first thing that God says to them is not, what did you do? He says, where are you? 
That is so important for us to, uh, to understand the heart of our God. He is more concerned in that moment with where we are than what we have done because he knows that we're not near him like we usually are. They weren't near him like they always were. They were hiding. They were separating themselves from him. So his question was, where are you? It was not accusatory. It was not condemning. It was, I love you. I want you near me, and you're not. Where are you? And then he deals with the consequences and what they did after he knows where they are. So as soon as he uh, talks to them and, and he, he asks them that question, they go into confession mode. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. You know, it's just going around in a circle, and they confess everything that happened and what, and what they did. And then God lays out these consequences for them, and he starts with the serpent. He gives the serpent his consequences. And then he turns to the woman, and he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Very heavy stuff here. This is, this is the original sin. This is where it all starts. And these are their consequences. There's a lot there, but what I really want to focus in on is when is in verse 16, and God says to Eve, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. In other words, women will want to rule over man, and men will have a distorted desire to rule over women. We will now clash heads. We will now disagree. We will now both try to be in charge constantly, trying to putting our value in who's in charge and who's leading. And that's where we are now. This is the consequence that we're living in now. This is what we're dealing with. So what now? What do we do with this? One thing we need to understand is this. God did not create us to defeat each other as men and women. He created us to complement each other. Just like a team complements each other to accomplish their task, that is how we are to operate. Before I go into this next portion, it's our last text I want to go over, I do just want to like recognize the fact that not everyone in this room is married. And this next scripture is going to specifically speak to husbands and wives. But what I want to present to you is that this concept of how men and women are to interact can be applied to any man-woman relationship to a degree. Dads and daughters, brothers and sisters, friendships, what have you how we interact with coworkers, people in ministry with us. The fact that God made us ladies to be a helper, to support men in the roles that they've been put in, we are to be encouraging them, we are to be edifying them, we are to be spurring them on so that they can accomplish the task and the role God has given them. So I want to go into this next portion of Scripture, Ephesians 5, 21. And to give you a background on this uh, scripture, Jesus, this is like centuries later, Jesus has come, he's died, he's rose again and ascended into heaven. And Paul is writing these letters to a lot of different churches, spreading the gospel of Jesus. He's an apostle and he's spreading the gospel and he's writing um, a letter to the church of Ephesus here. And he's explaining to them what it looks like to let yourself be filled with the Holy Spirit. He lists some do's and some don'ts. And one of the do's he's listing is, to it showing that you're walking in the Spirit. He says this in verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. I just want to stop there for a minute because that does include everyone. We are submitting to each other out of reverence for Christ. And then he goes into the husbands and wives, and he says this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, 
his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that she might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies." He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of this body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He's quoting Genesis here that we just read. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. There's a lot there, but Paul is driving one main point home. He repeats it three times, and it's this concept of Christ and the church. Christ and the church. He is saying, we as the women represent the church, and the man represents Christ. So if we are fashioning ourselves after Christ and the church, we need to be observing this relationship. We need to be looking at it and representing it in our interactions with the opposite gender. So a word I want to look at is at the very, it's in verse 22, and it's the word submit. Yeah, really fun word there. Um, I think this has really caused a lot of controversy in the body of Christ. I think this is another one of those trigger words that get ladies a little upset. They're like, why is that even there? I don't understand it. It's been abused in my life, so I don't want to even look at this scripture, you know, and, um, and it, it has been abused, and it's, it's been misconstrued. So let's look at it. And I'm going to tell you right now, the definition of the word submit is not going to help you. (laughs) You're not going to like it. Um, The definition does mean put under. That is what that word means. And you're like, okay, well then why is it there? (laughs) Like, why is this in scripture? Why is this okay for me to be told I have to submit to a person? Like, that doesn't feel safe to me. That feels vulnerable because we're broken people and not everyone's perfect. And I understand that. So let's look at why it's there. Let's look, at, let's look at this relationship of Christ and the church. What I want to do is I also want to look at the fact, why is it okay for the church to submit to Christ? Why don't we freak out about that statement? Why is that not, why is that not unsettling to us that the church submits to Christ? Why is that not a big deal? It's because we know what Christ did for the church. We know he died, he loved her, he gave himself up for her, Why wouldn't she want to submit under Christ because of that? That's the safest place the church could be. That's where we need to be, is submitting ourselves under Christ. It's the safest place for us. It's what makes sense. And that is what God is calling us to be as men and women. He is is charging the men here to represent Christ. That is a huge responsibility. And he's calling us ladies to submit under Christ that love and authority of the men. And I know a lot of us might be thinking, well, it's kind of hard to submit under someone who's not loving me like Christ. I'm just sitting here waiting to be loved like Christ, and it's not happening, you know, and I'm trying to do my thing. I'm trying to help him die to himself. (laughs) I'm trying to help him die for years, you know. (laughs) Spiritually, not physically. I mean, you know, but... Ladies, it is not our job to help men die to themselves. That is the Holy Spirit's job. That is the job of God. That is not our role. We are to be um, encouraging, edifying verbally, supporting them. So how does this work? Christ in the church. As we said, Jesus died for the church so she can submit under him. In 1 John 4.19, it says this, We love because he first loved us. So we, the church, love because he, Jesus, first loved us. It starts with Jesus, and it does start with the man. And that's not to give us ladies any excuses at all. We can't just sit around, like I said, waiting for him to love me like Christ. We are still to be walking in our role in a godly way. But it does mean that we need to stop trying to make it start with us. That's not our role. It's supposed to start with him. And it's a huge responsibility, just like it was a huge responsibility for Adam in the garden. That was a big job for him, and God saw it was not good that he did it alone, so he brought Eve. 
So we are to be helping them however they need in order to fulfill this role that God has given them. We need to respect it. We need to encourage it. We need to believe in it with them. That means putting away micromanagement and control and letting them lead, letting them be men, encouraging them in it, edifying them, being their support, being their biggest fans, cheering them on. And again, not just about husbands and wives. This is about just the men in your life in general. They need to know we're behind them. We support you. We want to see you walk in this amazing role God has given you. It's not about who's more valuable. Again, we can't look at it that way. It's about the order that God has created to best glorify himself and represent Christ in the church. Us ladies were designed to receive, and men were designed to give and provide. So now we need to ask this question that I know we're all wondering about. Because I know there's brokenness in this room because these roles have not been displayed correctly. So what happens when we fail to carry out these roles that we've been designed to do? What happens? What happens when men don't provide what is needed or decide ruling over their wife means abusive behavior is okay or neglect, abandonment? What happens when women refuse to receive what is given and just say, it's not good enough, sorry, keep trying? What happens when women no longer support the men in their lives and they just become obsessed with defeating them instead and being in charge instead of helping them? What happens is this, God's design is broken, sin enters and brings death and separation into our relationships, just like in the garden. But the story did not end there for them, and it does not end with, for us either. God knew that when he created Adam, Adam would be representing Jesus. He knew when he created Eve, she would be representing the future church. Even then, God was planning our redemption. He knew we would need this picture to see in order to understand what Jesus was going to do for us and how we can walk in relationship with him. Even then, he had it all in mind. And today, I know in this room, again, that there are areas of death in this room that need redemption, that need resurrection. Maybe you've been impacted by a family member or a friend or a significant other who has not walked in their role the way God has designed. Maybe you know you've neglected your role a little bit and you want to change that. Maybe you're thinking, it's, it's too late. All the damage has been done. We're you know, it's, it's over. No restoration. No redemption. It's over. Let me tell you something. If it wasn't too late for Adam and Eve, it's not too late for anyone. Yes, they had consequences. Sin always brings consequences. The wages of sin is death. Absolutely, there are consequences. But there is restoration and healing that God offers. The next portion in Genesis, after he gives them their consequences, he does something amazing, incredible, and it shows us the heart of God again and his grace and his mercy they're standing there in their fig leaves that they made in their pitiful attempt to cover their shame. And God had just laid out all the consequences and he could have gone further and just stood there and just humiliated them and shamed them standing there, pointed at them, mocked them. What does God do? We read that God clothed them with animal skins. And that means, that's very important because that was the first blood sacrifice made and it was made to cover their shame. That was a foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to do for us. He died. He spilled his blood. He paid the ultimate sacrifice to cover any shame, brokenness that you may be experiencing today. And he's offering the same thing to you. He wants to cover you today. We try so hard to cover ourselves. We try to. We try to fix our marriages in secret. We try to restore relationships without any support or help. We do our best, but it is not good enough. God wants to clothe you today. I cannot promise you that the marriage is going to work and come back together. I don't know that. But what I do know is that God will restore you. He will make you a whole person again. He will not leave you broken he will not leave you abandoned. He will restore you. He will redeem your situation in one way or another because that is who God is, period. Anyone trying to tell you otherwise, just like that serpent, is lying to you. 
It is not truth. Go back to your word and look at what the truth is. Refuse to be lied to in this. God has created you to be an image bearer as a whole, as his image bearers, men and women were created to glorify God together. That is what he made us for. That is our purpose. That is our worth. That's our value. That's our identity. That is our identity, to glorify God. So I just want to invite you guys this morning to cry out to him. Ask him to do a mighty work in you or in in any situation that you may have been affected by or you see something happening and you want to pray over it. Let's embrace these roles. Let's take them back the way God intended and show our culture the beauty of God's design and how it brings life. It does not bring death and destruction. It brings life when we walk in these roles the way God designed. It's an incredible thing to to walk in. It fulfills us because that's what we're made to do. Let's take them back. You can cry out to God right where you are in your seats. I know this is a very personal thing to come forward for. Don't feel like you have to. But if you're like, look, I do need to be surrounded today. I can't, I can't battle this alone today. We're going to have prayer teams up here to pray with you. And if that's you, you come forward, get that prayer. If you're wanting to just lift up someone else's situation, because I know it's all around us, the brokenness, the hurt. We see it in loved ones too. If you just want to lift that up, come forward or pray in your seat. Whatever you want to do this morning, just let the Spirit lead you. God can breathe life into dust. He can breathe life into anything. Nothing is too far gone. Nothing. So come to him today. He wants you near him. He wants to know where you are. I'm just going to pray over you guys. God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this body, this family. You see every situation in this room. You see every situation for those watching online, God, and you want to intervene. You want to know where we are. You want to know what, where our hearts are, God. You want us near you. You don't want us far. I pray, God, that if there is separation between us and you because of this brokenness that's in our world, that it would go, that we would find ourselves near you, that we would let you clothe us and restore us today, God. I do pray over broken marriages today. I pray over people that might be struggling in secret, I pray, God, that you would reach down today and touch these relationships, these marriages, these households. I pray for children that have been hurt by parents who did not walk in their role correctly, that are dealing with trauma, that are dealing with pain from that. Restore them to you, O God. Restore them and fill them with your spirit. I pray, God, that we would be a people that says, I might have been impacted by someone else not walking in their role, but it stops with me. I am going to walk in this role with everything I have. I pray that your Holy Spirit would move now, Jesus. We give you this time. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.